Hello, my name is Stephen Graham from Newcastle University in the UK. And uh, I'd like to do a talk now that uh, helps to mark the opening of the Subterra exhibition at the Arkham Centre in Amsterdam. Originally, I was uh, going to go over to the centre and participate in the launch um, to do a face-to-face -face talk, but sadly, um, COVID had other plans and uh, I have to isolate now, so I'm unable to do that. But instead, I'm going to offer a recorded lecture, um, a short recorded lecture, where I just want to un identify and underline some of the key sort of cultural, political um, and historical aspects of the subterranean of cities that the, the uh, exhibition engages with so, so, so excellently. Before I do that, I'd just like to thank the, uh, the staff at Arkham um, for the invitation to be involved and, and to say, um, hope I can make it face to face in, in the near future. But let me start with this image here. Um, this is an image of one of the exhibitions in the catacombs in Paris, one of the most famous um, subterranean worlds in, in, in terms of the Western history anyway. And this is an exhibition dealing with Les Miserables, the famous novel and subsequently film and theatre production and so on, by Victor Hugo, which very much deals centrally with the possibilities of life in the underground as a sort of space of insurrection against the surface. We'll return to Victor Hugo um, later on. But um, in terms of where we're at for the exhibition, um, well, we're in Amsterdam, and Amsterdam is like many cities, reaching down, is building down in many, many ways. And it's a compact city, um, which is having to engage much more fully with its subterranean histories, which are always very contested, very difficult technically, and often very unknown. So in Amsterdam, we have the new metro system, the new metro line, we have projections for tunnels going underneath the, the waterways. We have large scale projections for un underground city complexes in, 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 in the round. Um, the Amphora one is the most famous. So as cities um, are unable to build outwards because of urban containment, and they're unable to build upwards very often because of urban conservation planning, Often the only way they can actually expand this to, is to go downwards. The first of seven points I want to stress, okay? The first one is how do we imagine the underground? How do we imagine this, this mysterious and often um, myth-laden world beneath the ground of the city? Well, I always start with this amazing quote from a book called Underneath New York, which came out way back in 1947 by Robert Sullivan. And he has this image of just a human hand pulling up the root system of Manhattan using the World Trade Center as, as a sort of device. And this is his quote, imagine grabbing Manhattan by the Empire State and pulling the entire island up by its roots. Imagine shaking it. Imagine millions of wires and hundreds of thousands of cables freeing themselves from the great hunks of rock, and tons of musty and polluted dirt. Imagine a sewer system and a set of water lines three times as long as the Hudson River. Picture mysterious little vaults just beneath the crust of the sidewalk, a sweaty grid of steam pipes 103 miles long, a turn of the 18th century merchant ship buried underneath Front Street, rusty old gas lines that could be wrapped 23 times around Manhattan, and huge bomb-proof concrete tubes that descend almost 80 stories into the ground. So it's a marvellous evocation of the incredible complexity um, and depth of the city's root system, if you like. Okay, that's one point. Um, the need to imagine the subterranean of the city, something that's often neglected in urban literatures, in urban policy making, in urban, um, in urban sort of studies. The second point, the, the underground is a long history as a space of both demonization by the, by the elites and the wealthy above, and as a space of insurrection. And um, I'll just move myself a little bit over here so I can read the text. Um, a wonderful place to start here is the, the investigative sort of 
expose of the basement dwellers, again in New York in 1890, one of many um, reformist attempts to go into the subterranean basement world, which was normally a world of desperation, a world um, where only the poorest um, would live in pretty horrific um, conditions. This still goes on in many cities in the world where it's basically the poorest, the worst quality, the most dank and uh, disease ridden and water water filled spaces. Jacob Reeves went into the underworld and uh, he that he was so horrified by it that he deemed the people who lived in these spaces as cave dwellers whose descent into the subsurface was paralleled by a sort of moral collapse. Um, a collapse that uh, Tom Heiss, the geographer, puts it, it was so bad that they were hardly worth life on the surface. There's a long history of elites and, and commentators demonising the underworld of the city as a sort of um, troglodytic world that's to be to be feared, really. Um, but also it's a space where the, up, the, up, the above world of the city, the more, more sort of elite and wealthy city can be challenged. And going back to Victor Hugo, um, the chat, his protagonists in Les Miserables were very much challenging the, up, the upper surface city from the, the sewer system. And in the 1960s, the, the, the sort of revolutionary attempts in Paris in the late 60s, inspired by activists like the Situationists, a, a movement of activists, artists, and, and urbanists to challenge um, capitalism and cities and so on. They talked about um, the their activism as what they called the old mole still digging away. So they, they, they envisaged their activism as literally something coming from the subterranean world from below to challenge the above world. And they even use this very famous slogan, sous le pavé, la plage, underneath the pavement, the beach, to, to sort of mark that vertical imagination of the city. And as we said before, in Les Miserables, 1862, um, the protagonists literally live in the sewers. This is before they were highly engineered spaces. They were, they were a space where um, people could live without much challenge from above, without much policing from above. Um, and Victor Hugo called the sort of sewers of, the, of Paris in those times the conscience of the city. There was a purity to that world, which she found in sharp contrast to the conceits of the of the bourgeois city above. He, this is another quote that Hugo has in, in that work. He said that um, the sewers, are no, there are no more false appearances, no possible plastering. The filth takes off its shirt, absolute nakedness, the rout of illusions and of mirages, nothing more but what it is. The last veil is rent. A, a sewer is a cynic, it tells all. So here the, the underground and the underworld is, is projected as a space to challenge the world above, a, a space that is more authentic somehow, that is, um, is, more, um, is more easy to sort of grasp than the the commodity, commodified and bourgeois world of the city above. Third point I want to stress is that the underground has a long history as a space of sanctuary. Okay, this is um, a very, very old tradition in, in cities where spaces can be sanctuaries from the world above in all sorts of ways. And we've seen that very powerfully in the last 70 or 80 years since uh, World War II. And during the Cold War, where every city built a large sort of complex of subterranean bunkers, subterranean refuges, which are now often redundant or dormant or being used for other things. So subterranean burrowing, and this is a quote from the French philosopher Paul Virilio, progressed to, quote, such an extent that burial would be accomplished definitively and the earth would become nothing more than an immense glasses exposed to nuclear fire. So this is a world where uh, millions were projected to literally cower into the subterranean space um, in response to the, 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 the risks of 
nuclear attack from from missiles launched across the earth and using the inner orbits of space. There are other histories of the subterranean, rather like uh, the Victor Hugo tra tradition, where many, many people actually live in the spaces below cities, in those vast root systems and tunnel systems and bunker systems that go down so deeply under many cities. And again, in New York, this is a celebrated uh, tradition where literally tens of thousands of people um, shelter from the, the heat and the, the winter in vast complexes of tunnels and caves and uh, bunkers and, and other spaces deep, 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 deep beneath the surface of Manhattan. Um, one one uh, of these dwellers, Mark Singer, who was interviewed for many, one of the many works about this tradition says, um, living homeless on the street is very physical. If it rains, you get wet and you only have as much as you can carry. But in the tunnels, you can build yourself a house. So certainly before the tunnels became much more securitized and policed post 9-11, there were spaces here where people could literally build their homes. And, and OK, there would be um, challenging places to live. There would be um, an absence of services and infrastructures and so on, obviously an absence of daylight. But there could still be a claim of space um, in a very difficult environment where people have very little in terms of wealth and resources. This is one of the works about the subterranean communities in New York, um, Jennifer Toth's The Mole People. It was rather problematic, it was quite voyeuristic, and there's an issue with calling people mole people. There's a danger that you animalize these, these communities. Um, but nevertheless, it was a powerful expose of the huge and large communities living so deep underneath New York. Refuges also happen in the sort of cultural space. There's a remarkable um, sort of catophile culture underneath Paris. Again, something that's increasingly challenged by security operations in the like in the um, in a world of terrorist attacks, the this, this, this subterranean is, is a space of fear where you worry that attacks are being used to exploit, are used by exploiting these systems. But underneath uh, Paris is a whole world of, of clubs and theatres and, and sort of peripatetic and temporary activities, music and film and so on, um, which are attracted to the sense that the subterranean is somehow more authentic because it just accumulates material over decades and decades and decades. It rarely gets changed. It rarely gets reconfigured. Material is rarely removed. Um, and in the, in the wonderful book, Paris Underground, th there's an estimate that there are 80,000 Parisian cataphiles per year um, using those various spaces, obviously left over by the catacombs, but also the vast quarries which were used to build Paris, the gypsum quarries. That book is by Caroline Archer and Alexander Paré, and this highly recommended, by the way. These days, um, uh, refuges are also applicable to the super rich. I mean, the basement, as we said, is traditionally a, a place of the desperate. But in London, we now have what's the phenomenon of the iceberg house, where the super rich, and London is the predominant world city in the world for the super rich, are burrowing down with remarkable um, projects, projects which go down five to six stories sometimes with car museums and swimming pools and bowling alleys and private servants quarters and cinemas. Um, this is a hugely problematic phenomenon because of the disruption of the construction, because of the impact on drainage, the impact on above surface um, ecosystems and tree systems and so on. Uh, but also the sense that it marks a hyper inequality in London, as many of the services that are being privatized individually into these spaces are being closed and reconfigured on, on the surface. We've done some work in Newcastle University, particularly with College Reggie Burroughs and Xander Wilson, to literally map this sort of emerging basement belt. And some of the mega basements we found are 
remarkable. Literally hundreds of swimming pools, even tennis courts being built deep into London. London's quite easy to build into because it's got alluvial soil, unlike New York, which is very hard uh, volcanic rock. This is the basement belt in London that we've, um, we've revealed in terms of standard ordinary basements, large basements and what we call mega basements. These are the ones with the pools and uh, bowling alleys and goodness knows what else. So the refuge is now um, proliferating in its, in its uses um, because of the wealth of the tiny elites and so on. Fourth point, what about exploration? Well, there's a whole, again, history of um, people who basically get their thrills by going into these uh, unexplored, poorly mapped, often proscribed places of the, the subterranean city. Um, and there's an interesting literature about this, because what, what it often does when people explore these places and the towers is that people start to get a much more three dimensional view of the cities. Um, it's about transcending the normal and the spaces that where most urbanites are confined. The, the surface city with limited sort of shepherded movements up and down. Um, and it's about, uh, again, a space of authenticity and an experience of authenticity away from sort of mass tourism. OK, fifth point. What about tourism? Um, there's an extraordinary phenomenon now, what's called dark tourism around the world where many tourists are, are drawn to sites of disaster, sites of war, sites of um, conflict. And what I find is fascinating is that many of these tourists are drawn to the subterranean sites, which previously were the most secret sites in the entire world. And there's a remarkable tourist road sign here in uh, Essex in England, one of many where the road sign actually says secret nuclear bunker. And of course, that's quite an ironic road sign, given that for decades, huge efforts were made to keep these things very, very secret from uh, Soviet, Soviet reconnaissance and surveillance. Um, the challenge really is to understand this dark tourism. And Don DeLillo in his novel Underworld talks about the, the, the urge to, quote, travel somewhere not for museums and sunsets, but for ruins, bombed out terrain, for the moss-grown memory of torture and war. Um, uh, uh, there's been a huge growth of tourism into the subterranean elements of cities. Um, you can, not necessarily just cities either, you can go into a the bunkers and the silos where nuclear weapons were housed during the Cold War, where they still are in other silos. There's a Titan missile museum in the United States, for example. Um, in many cities, though, this heritage and this history is problematic, um, and it raises all sorts of questions about um, what tourism is, is legitimate and what, what tourism needs to be constrained, really. And the remark, most remarkable example of, of this, the most remarkable example of a, of a voluntary organization helping to explore and expose the subterranean heritage of a city is in Berlin, where you have a remarkable group called the Berlin Underworld Association, the Berliner Unterwelten, um, who have built a, a remarkable series of museums, a remarkable series of tours, a remarkable series of publications, which explore um, Berlin's astonishing um, subterranean inheritance. A lot of this is about flat towers and bunkers and Cold War tunnels and so on. And yet some of these subterranean remnants are problematic. And quite, in the nine, quite recently, um, some of the bunkers around Hitler's chancellery near Potsdamer Platz you know, were exposed. And all of a sudden there was all this SS artwork on the walls and so on. And of course, there's a danger that these sites become sort of magnets for, for, for fascists and for Nazi activists and so on. So in some occasions, these, um, these spaces have been infilled and, and removed from public knowledge. Um, what about point six? 
Well, point six is uh, to emphasize the enormous growth in planning, design, construction, and living for the subterranean. As in Amsterdam, many cities are really not able to build, build high as much as they want. They, they struggle to, to expand. And in the congested cause of cities, that the, the, the subterranean is the space of infrastructure, is the space where um, transport networks can be hollowed out, where energy, water, and, and waste systems are placed. Um, and increasingly, many um, places of activity, leisure activity, um, even residential living are being constructed. Um, some of these are mega projects. Some of these are huge projects involving very high capacity, very high speed rail systems, for example. This is an image of the uh, excavations going on underneath Manhattan for a new Amtrak network. And what happens is a lot of these uh, big new mega projects, subterranean mega projects, often challenge and destroy the more open worlds of the cataphiles, like in Paris, or the more um, amenable worlds where the homeless communities have been living, often backed up by increasing concerns, as I said, about security and the, the ways in which these spaces might be used for terror attacks to the city above. And Mark Singer, um, who went back to some of the spaces he'd researched the homeless communities in as part of his project Dark Days, he's a documentary maker, went back to some of these tunnels, the Amtrak tunnels, and he said, this is the quote, it was quite surreal, Amtrak, the train company, had literally hollowed out the space. They used to be actual paintings, an amazing art theatre, but they painted it grey. There was no graffiti, no rats no semblance that anyone had ever lived there. It was quite sanitized and heavily patrolled. So there's all sorts of contestations going on in the subterranean world between these places of controlled, um, sanitized infrastructure grids and the much more messy and open worlds of um, subterranean culture, subterranean living, uh, which have been there for a very long time. What happens with these mega projects, of course, is that they are extraordinary moments where you take out tens of thousands of cubic meters from the subterranean of the city. Often these are used to actually create new islands or new land. This happened in the, in the famous highway that was built underneath Boston. And this is happening in London now, where one of the biggest mega projects in the world is being put through London. This is the Crossrail network, very, very fast and high tech rail system that goes east to west right across the whole of London. Of course, what happens when you take this material out of the subterranean city is that you engage with the archaeology of cities. You know, cities continually build and destroy themselves over thousands of years. And in doing so, they literally entomb their own histories their own bodies. I mean, there are 6 million people buried underneath Paris, it's been estimated, probably just as many underneath London. So when you dig, you excavate history, what's been called the archaeosphere, the archaeological um, bands that are underneath every building in, 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 in every city. And very old cities have remarkable archaeospheres. I mean, London's well over 2,000 years old. Um, so all across... Uh, the Crossrail network, the buildings has been an amazing opportunity for new archaeology, for Roman archaeology, for medieval archaeology, Norman, Saxon, and Victorian, and so on. So it's, and also even prehistoric. So it's another moment to get to grips with the time of the city and the sense of the city entombing its own histories continually as it builds its own ground over time. But there's, um, in terms of the, the question of building in the city, there's a very deep history here, deep, deep history here of imagining how cities might use their under, underground spaces. There's even been speculations, this is in the 1930s, that massive, great big mega structures might be entombed into the ground where people would live with light reflected deep into the, into the sort of atria 
of these mega structures, allowing people to, to fulfill um, reasonable lives deep un under the ground. Um, there's been a long history of real projects, and real proposals along these lines. The most, uh, one of the most famous was underneath the River Seine in Paris, projected by Paul Mimon in, in 1963, very much in line with the sort of massive mega structures of, of housing and other uses that were being built in and around Western cities at the time. This was a very deep um, subterranean space with infrastructure, with cultural uses, even tennis courts down there on car parks and, and hospitals and all sorts of multi-use systems. It was never actually constructed like many of these projections. Um, but many uh, engineering, architectural firms um, and planning firms are seriously building big underground projects now. They're very, very sophisticated. They're very, very um, well-engineered, well-designed and uh, well thought through. And Asia in particular is, is a hotbed for new spectacular levels of subterranean building, subterranean engineering. And it's so remarkable that I think in many cities anyway, that it, may, it, rever it takes us back to the first point, which is in a way is the same as the seventh point. Going back to the underneath New York quote um, of pulling up New York by the Empire State, I think my final point is that we need to imagine geographies of cities, what geographers call imaginative geographies, in new ways. We need to have new ways of understanding how the subterranean links with the ground level and the upper and above ground level. And of course, the exhibition at Arkham is one of these efforts to get us to rethink the city in, in new ways. On the back of this, I think a very inspiring attempt to do this is perhaps the most in the most three-dimensional city of all, which is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a spectacular set of sort of mega structural cities and sub-cities, if you like, which go way above ground into spectacular vertical towers, which transcend the ground level with lots of levels of escalators and walkways and podiums and so on, and which also go deep underground in vast worlds of infrastructure and retail and so on. It's so spectacularly three-dimensional that a traditional two-dimensional map is basically useless because the 2D map can only give you one of these many levels. Um, and the response, in response to this problem, a wonderful book was produced by Adam Frampton and colleagues called Cities Without Ground. And this is an example of what the book offers. It offers what, what you might call a cognitive map, a three-dimensional map of an area of Hong Kong showing you where all the lifts are, the, ele the elevators, the escalators, the walkways, the podium ways, the infrastructure networks and so on. And it actually gives you a, a, a meaningful way to navigate because I don't know if people have been to Hong Kong, it's often very hard to actually find your way around because of this incredible 3D um, geography. You can just find your, yourself walking into a, an office complex by accident or a high-end hotel lobby where you've no idea where you've, you've, you've got there. It's very easy to get lost. So this is one example of how I think we need to revisit the way we imagine cities. In, on the back of this ex, uh, increasing world of subterranean construction, but also vertical construction, and the book that has been uh, uh, an element of the discussion around the Arkham exhibition that, that I produced was called Vertical, the city from satellites to bunkers, which very much deals with the above ground questions as well. Um, finally, I'd, I'd perhaps emphasize that, again, there's no, this is not a new thing and uh, an, a fascinating world to explore in terms of how subterranean cities are imagined is the world of science fiction. Uh, that's a very long history. It's as old as sci-fi itself, but science fiction has hundreds of sort of subterranean urban imaginaries, often very dystopian, but very interesting nonetheless. This is just one example of the Zion complex in the matrix, which is built four kilometers down into the ground. But we can go back to the history of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and, and many other science fiction uh, originators. 
that is um, all I wanted to say, but I wanted to just emphasize that it's been a great pleasure and privilege to, um, to participate in the event. I hope I get a chance to come over face to face and um, participate in that way. But I wish the exhibition every success and uh, thank you very much for your time.